the whole world sees you. So, welcome everyone tonight. It is now six o'clock in the Holy Dhamma of Mayapur. And we're continuing to talk about the Dhammadar Leela. And tonight we're talking about the cursing of Nalukuvera Mani Griva. And um, it's amazing, amazing lessons to be learned from this chapter. And we ended the last class. We were saying that Narada Muni, Narada Muni was traveling and he was thinking about the Dhamma Dar Lila and he was now going to be part of the Lila that he was thinking about. Very interesting. Right? Your Krishna's pastimes are eternal. So now the same pastime is going to happen again. And he's chanting about the pastime that's about to happen and then he's going to enter into the pastime. So what's happening is that <clears throat> Narada Muni has the tree Kala Gya Shakti so he knows about Nala Kuvera and Mani Griva and he decided that he wanted to teach them a lesson. But he had interesting thoughts. He thought, Nalaka Veramani Griva are devotees of Lord Shiva. But they're misbehaving, and I need to teach them a lesson. If I just curse them, punish them, there'll be no ultimate benefit because they might do it again. You've probably been punished before. And did the same thing. Over. Maybe. Yes? You punish a child, it doesn't mean they won't do it again. So he thought, if I just curse them, they may not solve the problem. So I'll bless them also. I'll give them bhakti. Because if I give them bhakti, that will solve the problem. Right? And actually, a devotee, he doesn't curse unless there's some benefit. So he was thinking what to do. And then, as a pure devotee, he, he was, it was very instructive how he was thinking. Because he was thinking, I want to bless Nalukuvera and Mani Griva. I want to, I want to benefit them. But it's not right to curse them because they're devotees of Lord Shiva. So he knows the curse will be good, but he's feeling that he'll be making an offense if he curses them. So this is what was going through his mind. Interesting, right? It's a symptom of humility that I want to, I want to help this person. But if I curse them, and they're devotees of Lord Shiva, that would be offensive. Kind of like when you're in a position of authority and you have to correct someone, you should be reluctant to correct them because the position of a Vaishnava is always to correct themselves, not to correct others. So if you have to correct another person because of your position, naturally you feel reluctant. Right? You're, you're, you always want to be in a humble position. So this is what Narada Muni is going through. He's thinking, how do I do this? Now, Nalukavera Mani Griva, as we said last week, were in Kailash, in a lake, and they were very beautiful. And they were very wealthy. So I don't know if you know anyone who is very beautiful and very wealthy. But if you do, their life is probably not so pure, generally. If you're very beautiful, you become proud. If you're very wealthy, you become proud. If you're very beautiful and wealthy, you become very proud. Or 
If your father is Kuvera, you become proud. And if you're very beautiful, then you can get all the beautiful girls. Which makes it more of a problem. So that was their situation. As we said last week, they were upgraded to the heavenly planets by the worship of Lord Shiva. And so now they could enjoy apsaras. Just like, let's say, your father becomes wealthy and then you're able to move into a nice neighborhood. So now you can enjoy all the rich girls. Whereas before, it was only poor girls. And generally, the karma of rich people, they're also more beautiful. I don't know if you've noticed that, but generally, it often works that way. The people who have the the good money karma also have the good body karma. So, or at least they have enough money to make themselves look good. So, so what happened was Narada Muni decided that he wanted to bless them and he decided that as sons of Kuvera, he shouldn't allow this to happen. This is not fitting these sons, and they should actually be living like demigods. And now now they're not living like demigods. And I can't allow their illicit activity to continue because they'll just ruin their lives. And it's also, it's not proper. It's also, in a sense, degrading or blasphemous of their father. It's an embarrassment when the father has sons like this. So what happened was, Narada Muni was coming to the area and while he was still at a distance, the girls who weren't so intoxicated and were just generally more sober than the boys, they saw Narada Muni coming. And immediately, they had long hair, they just covered their bodies with their hair and they ran out of the water and they dressed themselves. And when they ran out of the water, they were yelling to Nalakuvera and Manigriva, saying, Narada Muni's coming, get out of the water, get dressed. And they were so intoxicated. You ever seen a person that's so intoxicated they don't know? Or maybe you've had that experience. You actually don't know what you're doing. My generation was not an alcohol generation. It was a psychedelic generation. Well, they drank wine also a little bit. I personally wasn't attracted. But once in my life I drank, and I guess I drank too much, because I was like that, you know, at that point where people would tell me what I did last night and I couldn't remember. So that's what happens if you get very drunk, you know, you you do things. Now you don't remember. So they were in this state (coughs) where the girls couldn't convince them. They kept saying, get out, get out, Narada Muni's coming. And they were just splashing water on themselves and they were just joking. The girls were saying, come on, come on, Narada Muni's coming. This is serious. Didn't work. So Narada Muni, as you know the story, he shows up on the scene. The girls are now dressed, they're out of the water. And they're disrespectful, they're drunk. They're not even dressed. Could you imagine? I mean, just being naked in front of anyone? What to speak of Narada Muni? I was just like, you don't care. Yeah, so that's kind of where we left off last week, more or less. So now Narada Muni shows up. Very interesting things are going on. Um, this is his first thought. As demigods, they should be in the mode of goodness. But they're not, obviously not. Now they're in passion and ignorance. So his, this was his concern. Um, so his concern was their pride. Wealth created pride. Beautiful body created pride. And so he was thinking, they'll become sober, the intoxication will wear off. But when the to- intoxication wears off, the pride won't wear off. So the problem is not the intoxication as much as the pride, because the pride is the root cause 
of the problem. So this is how Narada Muni was thinking. I have to do something to curb their pride because until they become humble, they're going to disrespect sadhus or disrespect anyone who tells them what to do. As you know, when you're proud, you don't listen to anybody. And it may be okay not to listen to some people, but when you don't listen to the right people, then you have no direction in life. So this, this was their position. And because of their beauty and their wealth, Narada Muni foresaw that their lives would be degraded. So he made a plan. He said, the plan is we have to curb their pride. That's the solution. And sometimes, um, as you know, Krishna, when a devotee becomes proud, he does something to curb their pride. And there's so many stories in Bhagavatam. Krishna doesn't like it when a devotee becomes proud. And we don't like friends who are proud. People who are very proud, what we call egotistical. Nobody wants to be around them because everything is about them. And all you're going to hear when you're with them is about what they've done and how great they are. And friends are people who reveal their challenges, their difficulties. That's what we like as friends. So just as we like that, Krishna also likes that. And so Krishna doesn't like a devotee who's proud because he can't have rasa with someone who's proud because the pride is the competition. When we're proud, we're competing with Krishna. So why would Krishna want to be close with someone who's competing with him? Secondly, it's not good for us. And that's the other reason he doesn't like it, because it's detrimental to our spiritual advancement. So for two reasons. We can't advance, and he can't have a relationship. Yes? What do you mean by uh, we compete with Krishna? Is it because we want to take Krishna's position, that's why we compete, as opposed to having a relationship? What did I mean by that? Yeah, is it, is it that we're trying to take Krishna's position by being proud, so then therefore we can't have a relationship? Indirectly. Because, yeah. I mean, the way you're situated in devotional service is at the feet of Krishna. So pride is the opposite. And pride is the cause of separation. I don't need God. I can do it myself. You know, pride hits its, <coughs> hits its climax in atheism. atheism. Even though the atheistic person may be a humble person, from the spiritual perspective, he's the most proud because he denies any source greater, any ultimate source that he has to surrender to and acknowledge. So, so when we talk about imitating Krishna, it comes in many different forms, just by ignoring what Krishna says or not believing that he exists or thinking, I don't need any direction, uh, I, can't, I don't need to listen to anybody. Even relativistic morality, there's no absolute right and wrong. All these things are manifestations of envy of Krishna. They just don't look like it to most people. Most people would not think, oh, this person is envious of God. Not envious, I just don't believe in him. Or God's not relevant to me. I'm a good person and that's my religion. You know, so creating non-absolutes um, these are all forms of envy. It's just more subtle than like Sishupal, who just hates Krishna and wants to kill him. Sishupal ultimately got blessed. You know that? Sishupal ultimately became, Krishna gave him bhakti. So, But envy manifests in... Um, Any, any form of hatred, any form of criticism, any form of resentment, jealousy, or envy, even to an animal, is a manifestation of our envy towards Krishna. Uh, Prabhupada um, once, I think in the Chaitanya Charjamrita, said that meat-eating is envy towards animals. Now, if any of you have ever eaten meat or know anyone who eats meat, do you think that they're envious of the animals? That's not generally how you think. So Prabhupada's using the word envy in a, in a broader way. But meat-eating is a manifestation of envy towards animals. Now, 
how do we understand that? Well, what would the opposite of envy be? What would some, some characteristics of a person who's not envious be? If you're not envious of animal, well, how would you treat them? Compassion. Compassion. What else? Appreciation. Appreciation. Support. In some way you would su support them, take care of them, obviously, right? Just like if you're envious of someone, do you help them? Sometimes if you're really envious, you may do something to impede their success. Or if you're really, really envious, you may just hire someone to take care of them, you know, to send them to another body, right? So to understand what Prabhupada means by envy, if you look at the opposite and then, and then think, am I doing that? So I'm not taking care of these animals, I'm eating them. So if the opposite of envy is love and compassion, then I must be envious of the animals, even though it doesn't, you know, like envy would mean, oh, I want to be a cow. No, I don't want to be a cow, I want to eat the cow. But you're envious of the cow because you want to eat him. Envy in the sense of you're not allowing him to live or you're not being compassionate, supportive, appreciative. Isn't so, it that most of the people don't think about it? Yeah, that's the problem. They don't think about it. Let's take that same idea. What's the opposite of envy of God? Love, appreciation, obedience, and so forth. So if I'm not loving, obedient, appreciative, then I'm envious of God. Now, another way of looking at it is everything that a materialistic person wants, Krishna has in full. So what does a materialistic person want? He wants success. Krishna has the most success. He wants beautiful women, or women want beautiful men. Krishna has all the beautiful women. Krishna has all the friends. We all want friends. He's got all the money. Everybody wants money. So you want money, you want women, you want success, you want all these things. Now, it seems innocent, but in some sense, it's not. Because if I'm a devotee, I want to give all the money, women, and success to Krishna. I don't want it for myself. So when I'm not a devotee, I want it for myself. So that means I don't want it for him, I want it for me. I must be envious. Otherwise, why don't I give it to him? Just like, let's say we're walking down the street, and you find a bag of a million dollars. And we're really good friends, and you don't give me any. So what would my first thought be? We're not really good friends. If we were, you'd give me half, at least. Right? That happened to me. When I was a kid, I found $8, and I gave my friend three. It was a five and three ones, and I gave him three. And everybody thought that was amazing. Because in my culture, you know, we're Jewish, so you get money, you hold on to it. So they thought it was amazing, you know. But, you know, like the Jews are like the counterparts of the Mawaris in India. So um, you love somebody, you give. The more you love, the more you give. So you get the money, you keep it for yourself. You get the women, you keep them for you. This is my wife. I have the right to enjoy her. Now you're a devotee. It's not my wife. It's, I'm, I'm giving this woman protection, but ultimately she belongs to Krishna. So a devotee's not envious, so he doesn't try to enjoy his wife, he doesn't try to enjoy his children. And that's why when a man challenged Prabhupada that Krishna's dancing with other men's wives, he said, all women are Krishna's wives. You're the one stealing the wife. Your wife is Krishna's. You're the thief, not him. As if Krishna is envious of other men's wives. You know? He's... Right? He's blessing them. Does that make sense? Prabhupada once said, I have a motto. Everything for Krishna, nothing for me. Now, if you're not Krishna conscious and you hear that, that sounds like... That's like that really sounds like deprivation to the max. 
But when a man falls in love with a woman or a woman falls in love with a man, that's what they say. I'll do anything for you. Just marry me. I'll do anything for you. I love you so much. I'd, I'd die for you. There's a joke like that. The, the man says to the wife, I would die for you. And she says, well, you always say that, but you never do it. <laughs> So that's the symptom of love. So in that sense, we understand if we're holding back, we're envious. Which it all belongs to Krishna, and we don't want to give it, we want to keep it. So there. If you love somebody, you give them you want to give them everything. Right? There's a there's um a friend of ours is thinking of moving to Mayapur and they can't come yet because their daughter's in a private art school. Uh, apparently she must be a very talented artist and will have a good future as an artist. And the tuition is 50,000 US dollars a year. So she's going four years. So they can't come because they have to work very hard. And they're both working very hard to put their daughter through school. So they're making this huge sacrifice so she can get this good education to, to give her a good situation in her life. That's love. That's what you do. If you were envious of that kid and said, I never wanted you. You were an accident. I hate you. said, figure it out yourself. I'm not going to work for you. I've already worked enough. I've worked 20 years for you. Now you figure it out. Some parents will do that. Yes? What? <laughs> Get out of the house. I don't want to. So where there's love, there's extreme sacrifice. And when there's complete love, there's complete you become a slave to the person you love. And so when Prabhupada says everything for Krishna, nothing for me, that's the manifestation of that extreme love. And when Prabhupada says it, he feels the greatest bliss. And when we hear it, we shiver. Ah, oh, how could I live like that? No, but when you love Krishna, you'll say the same thing. It's only natural. Uh, there was one of Srila Prabhupada's godbrothers was talking about this once, and he said, our aspiration is divine slavery. So the word slave doesn't have a positive connotation. We aspire for divine slavery, just to be to do whatever is Krishna's will, I want to respond to that. Divine slavery. Amazing, huh? And that's our aspiration. So, Would you like to be a slave? But when you fall in love, you become a slave of love. You can write a song, Slave of Love, and probably there already is one. I've been a slave of love. But that's what happens, right? I can't live without you. I'm a slave. I'm thinking about you 24 hours. I'm a slave. I'm completely controlled by you. Just tell me what to do. I, I want to do whatever I can to please you. That's what gives me pleasure. When you have children, you become a slave of your children. It's a, called burden of love. Or you could call it the slave of love. There's a pleasure in being a slave. <laughs> for a materialist, maybe, yeah. Um, not for transcendentalists. <laughs> Certainly not in war, no. Um, well, just as a side point, the, the Krishna conscious position on love is a little different. <clears throat> because in Krishna consciousness you love even if you don't love because you love as a duty it's, it's my duty to love my wife it's my duty to love my husband so even though I don't like him I love him because it's my duty that's a you know, that's a a dharmic perspective but modern perspective is that it's very difficult to do how can I love you if I don't well 
just like you love your mother. Why, you, sometimes your mother mistreats you and your friends say, why do you love your mother? She, she mistreats you because she's my mother. That's your only answer, because she's my mother. She gave birth to me. Yeah, but she mistreated you. She beat you. She yelled at you. She made you work as soon as you got home from school. I know, but I love her. Love her? You're crazy. No, she's my mother. So that idea is there. We, why do you love him? He's my husband. Why do you love her? She's my wife. Do you actually love her? Hmm. <laughs> Not that much anymore, but it's a different kind of love. You know, it's where, my duty. Yeah. It's either my duty or it's the love has turned <coughs> to a deep kind of friendship and it's not this romantic type love. It's, but still, you would do anything for that person. It's just not so passionate. But even if you don't feel that way, still, the dharmic love, you would still do that. In the marriage ceremonies that Prabhupada conducted, he said, the husband, you say to your wife that I will take care of you and protect you throughout my life. And you, the wife says to the husband that I will serve you. There's something else I will serve and care for you like that. So that means whether you feel like it or not, that's what you do because that's your duty. So that's, that, that's love on a different level. You could say it's more real, right? That's the real thing. I don't even like you, but I love you. Because it's my duty to love you. Interesting concept, right? <clears throat> hmm. Okay, so then Narada Muni's thinking, we had discussed this last week, we can discuss a little more. He's thinking, okay, I have to curb the pride of intoxication. Now, if they became Krishna conscious, they would become humble. So then you might think, well, why didn't he just bless them with Krishna consciousness? Why did he curse them to become trees? That doesn't seem compassionate. Why didn't he just give them love of Krishna? <clears throat> you deserve better. You're sons of demigods. So I'll give you love of Krishna. But then he thought, they're not ready for love of Krishna. They can't handle it. <clears throat> so first I have to humble them. And then I give them love of Krishna, which is a nice instruction. That if you're not humble, you won't be qualified to get love of Krishna. So he wanted to give them love. But don't cast your pearls before the swine. And I think there's an Indian saying like that. Don't, I don't know, don't, don't throw diamonds to monkeys or something like that. I was reading, <clears throat> someone told Prabhupada don't ca this saying, don't cast your pearls before swine. I think that's from the Bible. And then Prabhupada quoted one like, don't give diamonds to monkeys or something similar. You know? This was Narada Muni's thinking, that I want to give them love, but I have to prepare them for it. So just in the same way, Krishna gives mercy according to, to how much you can handle. Like, how big is your bowl? If my cup is this big, and you want to give me one liter, you can't hold it. So because this is only how much my cup can hold, it's only how much we can pour. Right? Should I demonstrate? I have to stop pouring now. There's more in here that will fit in the cup. So this is love of Krishna, and this is how much I can handle. Right? So Narada Muni is saying, I have to make the cup bigger. And the way I can make the cup bigger is by putting them in a humble position. So because you were standing naked as trees, I will humble you and I will put you as trees. And in this way, you'll come to your senses. You know, often we don't come to our senses until we become humbled. 
isn't it? Sometimes, uh, maybe you've seen in your own life, the life of other devotees, that sometimes Krishna has to humble somebody first before he can give them the next installment of Krishna consciousness because it, it's, he can't give it to them or they can't hold on to it if they don't become humble. So this is Narada Muni's thinking. And then we've also seen with Srila Prabhupada many, many times when he detected pride in a devotee, he immediately cut it. Just... Um, Devotees, uh, many devotees have told this story that they would see that Prabhupada would compliment a devotee for doing something. And then the devotee would think, they would note, Prabhupada complimented this devotee for doing this. So they would note and say, I'm going to do that because I want to get a compliment from Prabhupada. <clears throat> and Prabhupada could understand the mentality that this is the wrong mentality. You don't want to do something to inflate your ego, to show off. You don't want to do something to show off. If you want to show off in front of your spiritual master, show off that you're a fool and show off that you're humble. Don't show off that you're great. Or, I mean, you can do something great, but don't do it so you can become number one in the eyes of your guru. Do it to please your guru in a humble way. So, so many times... Devotees would notice that Prabhupada complimented somebody for doing something, and they would do the same thing, and Prabhupada just ignored them or didn't say anything because he knew they were proud. There's a, a story a devotee had told, it's a funny story that devotees sometimes didn't know that they shouldn't put the Bhagavatam on the floor, and when Prabhupada saw it in the class, he told them you shouldn't put your Bhagavatam on the floor. So the devotee thought, I'll make a beautiful book cover for Prabhupada's Bhagavatam. Because if it's in a cover, it's not on the floor. It's like cloth. Sometimes we put cloth and then we put the Bhagavatam, although it should be raised. But that's better than nothing. So he made a cloth cover. And he got some beautiful cloth. He had the Pujari sew it. Maybe there were sequins, whatever. But he was very proud. And so when he gave Prabhupada this book cover, Prabhupada said, what is it? And he said, it's a book cover because you said Bhagavatam shouldn't go on the ground. Immediately Prabhupada said, I don't put my Bhagavatam on the ground. He's just like, pop. But the devotee who told the story said that I was in this mood of wanting to be complimented as giving Prabhupada an amazing gift a practical and both both practical and beautiful. But he had also brought a mango. And so he said what happened was he realized that Prabhupada had just popped his bubble of pride. It was obvious to him because he knew when that happened that Prabhupada saw where he was coming from and he became humble. And then Prabhupada said, what else do you have? Like Prabhupada knows. So what else do you have? He, he said, I have a mango. And Prabhupada said, ah, oh, mango. The king of fruits. And Prabhupada was very happy because now he was humble. And so the humble mood pleased Prabhupada. And even so, there are many, many stories devotees have told. Some, uh, one devotee told the story that he was on a walk with Prabhupada and some man was quoting shlokas and Prabhupada was Pleased, very pleased. And, and the devotee thought, I know so many shlokas. And they were talking about a topic, and then he quoted a shloka, and Prabhupada said, There are so many shlokas. Just like, <laughs> sit down. You know. like, so, so when Prabhupada would see that mentality, he would curb it because it's dangerous. And so this is what's going on here. So Narada Muni, you could say, is fertilizing the soil so they can become humble. And he wants to give them love, but he's preparing them. He's going in his mind because he's a spiritual master, and the spiritual master always thinks what's the best way to get Krishna consciousness into the heart. And that's why sometimes you'll see with Prabhupada or other spiritual masters or even with, with any authority, sometimes they're very gentle with someone and they're very heavy with someone else. 
because somebody needs a gentle hand, somebody needs a heavy hand. So depending on what's best for that person, the spiritual master will act accordingly. Sometimes we don't understand unless somebody is very heavy with us. Sometimes you, you try to reason with someone, they don't understand, you get heavy, and then they understand. So that's basically what Narada Muni is doing. I mean, this was heavy chastisement to become a tree. It's one thing to be chastised. It's one thing to be told to go home or apologize. This is becoming a tree. And he thought, this is probably, probably the only way that they're going to be cured. He was very afraid that it was going to continue. So this was like, he felt this was for sure the most assured way of solving the problem will make them trees. So it was actually a blessing. And this is what he had to do. And therefore it shows that sometimes a spiritual master can be very heavy if it's necessary. I mean, probably your spiritual master will not curse you to become a tree if you become proud. So, you probably don't have to worry about that. But it shows that sometimes the spiritual master will take heavy action if it's necessary. And as we see here, Narada Muni was doing it reluctantly. He was weighing all situations. I don't want to curse their demigods, but if I don't, then if I just give them instruction, the pride will not be removed entirely. They'll do this again. And so he weighed all the situations. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So, we said before that the girls had seen Narada Muni, but Narada Muni, before the girls noticed him, he was seeing what they were doing. So he, they were hugging and kissing, whatever they were doing. So he saw all of that. So, you know, he was, that was part of his analysis. That, you know, there. As we say in America, they've gone off the deep end. you say that in England? They've gone off the deep end. That the deep end of the water means they're kind of drowning themselves. Like, let's say you know you're a, a like a really good person, a good student, and then you got into bad association and you became degraded or whatever, became an alcoholic or a thief, and said he's gone off the deep end. It's just like. He's lost his sobriety, he's lost his morality, he's lost his sense. Yeah, when you lose your sense, we say you've gone off the deep end. You don't say that. You can go back and say it and see if anybody knows what you mean. Yeah, see, the thing is, when I'm in America, I don't have to explain these things. Here, I always have to ask, do you understand what that means? That's like, it's like I was in America, um, wow, I was in America in August. Yeah, I was, was actually in America this year, in America and Canada. Yeah, for maybe six weeks. I can't remember, something like six weeks. That was, was so nice. I never had to explain myself. But of course, now we're on the Internet, and I have to explain because American English and our phrases are not universally understood. All right, there, I have to see if there are any questions. Welcome to everyone. Hare Krishna. I'm just looking to see if you have any questions. You can have, if you have any questions, you can ask. Anyway, the, Krishna doesn't like it when, when we become proud. Prabhupada doesn't like it. Prabhupada's very concerned when he sees his devotees becoming proud. And he often does things to curb the pride. He's so concerned. I've never seen Prabhupada go out of his way to curb other tendencies as much as he's gone out of his way to curb pride. 
to just you know deal with people who are proud in a way like don't think you're important. Mm. Okay. So another example is given, and I gave this last week. Narada Muni, he's going again in his mind, and he's he's thinking about this idea of cursing, because it's a big thing. I'm going to take the sons of Nalukuver and Mani Griva and make them trees. That's like a pretty big decision, isn't it? I mean, if you were thinking of doing that, you'd probably... You don't want to make sure you're doing the right thing, isn't it? So, is this the right thing? Right. Mm. Mm. So he's uh, mm. contemplating this idea. Um, So he's, it's describing here his thought process. Mm. But he's thinking, okay, I'll, if I curse them as trees, and they become trees in Vrindavan, and they become trees in Nandamaraj's courtyard, then they'll get to see Krishna. And if I can arrange for Krishna to liberate them, then it's perfect. So he was balancing, he was figuring out how the curse was going to work. Yes? You say like the great souls when they curse, they don't actually curse, they, they actually bless them, right? Yes. But still, because what he's doing is so heavy, he's, <coughs> you know, it, it's showing his humility. It's showing... It's like there's a saying in America, when you punish a child, and let's say, I'm going to punish you, so, okay, bend over, whap, whap, you know, and slap you in the rear end or whatever. My father used to do that. I don't know if they do that anymore. It's funny, because he used to do that, and, you know, the idea is if you do that, then... It'll help you. That I can't remember for the life of me what I ever did that I deserved to be smacked in the rear end. I just don't remember. Like, I wasn't that bad. You know? So I don't, it didn't work on me. So anyway, it's, it's showing us the mentality of a pure devotee. That he's, he's feeling bad about this. Because these are devotees, you know, they're demigods, they're devotees of Lord Shiva. He's feeling, he's feeling somewhat bad about it. Well, he's, he, he figures that it's the best thing, but he's still feeling bad about it. So there's no resentment in his heart that they disobeyed me. So it's just his motive is just to bless them. You know, if he was an ordinary sadhu, he might curse them on a one-way ticket to become a tree, and that's it, because you offended me. So you deserve to be trees, then you can't offend anybody. You just serve everybody. You'll give them shade. That's the resentment. But it's devotee. So he wants to bless. At the same time, there's reluctance. So the saying in America is, when you get the child down, bend over, you say before you slap them, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. Right. So, you know, I'm, so it's kind of Narada Muni's mood. Is this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you, but this is what you need. So it shows this humility of a devotee. And um, this morning I was reading. The Bhakti Siddhanta was describing how a devotee, he always thinks that everyone is better, that I need to be rectified, that I am at fault. He's always looking at himself as the one who has the problem, as the one who needs to be improved. 
and, and never thinking that he's better than anybody, but always thinking that he's lower than everyone. I'm, this is how a pure devotee thinks. Now, it's interesting because we're so prone to criticize. And usually when we're criticizing, we're making judgments. And judgments are made from up here. Judgments are generally not made from down here. If you're making a judgment with compassion, okay, it's made from a humble, humble position. But most judgments that conditioned souls make are made from up here. We're judging you're right or wrong, and because I judge you're wrong, I criticize you. Where Bhakti Siddhanta is portraying the pure devotee who always thinks, I'm always in a lower position. So if I'm always in a lower position, then I won't be critical or judgmental, right? So Narada Muni, he's exemplifying that he's in that position, but he has a job to do. He has to rectify them. So basically he's thinking, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. Because I don't want to do this. And Prabhupada said to become the spiritual master is a thankless task. Not because you get the karma, but because you have to criticize. The spiritual master has to criticize the disciple. And it's thankless because a real Vaishnava never criticizes. So a real Vaishnava, his heart is pure. He doesn't criticize. He doesn't want to criticize. He just wants to honor and glorify and serve. Now as a spiritual master, you have to criticize and accept service. So it's not really the, the behavior of a devotee to accept service and criticize. So therefore, it's said to become guru is a thankless task. Because you're, you're doing things which are fundamentally opposed to the behavior of a Vaishnava. And you have to accept that as an austerity. And there was one devotee, he was criticizing other devotees. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur was trying to instruct him, give him some sense of what he was doing and how bad it was. And he said, that I am a spiritual master and it's my position to criticize, but I take it as a thankless task. I don't want to do it. It's not the position of a devotee to do it. So I don't want to do it, but I have to do it. I have to do the thankless task. And you don't have to do it, but you're doing it. So he said, why in the world would you want to criticize when it's not the behavior or not the action or not the nature of a Vaishnava to criticize. You become contaminated by it. Why in the world would you want to do it? It's not your job to do it. You're freed from that. You don't have to. And I have to. And I don't want to. And you don't have to. And you want to. You know, I compare that to a sannyasi who gets a job, you know, gets a job at IBM programming and working 70 hours a week. And you're thinking, Maharaj... Your sannyasi, your duty is to travel and preach, and if you do that, people will take care of you. You don't have to worry about money. Well, I'm working at IBM, and I hate it. I wish I didn't have to do it. But I have to support a family. And I'm working 60, 70 hours a week. And I can't stand doing it. But you don't have to do it. Why in the world would you do that? It's the same thing. Why in the world would you criticize when it's my job to do it, and I don't even want to do it, and it's not your job, and you're apparently enjoying it. So he's trying to make some sense. The point he was making is that if you're contaminated, you enjoy criticizing. And if you're a Vaishnava, you would never do it. You wouldn't enjoy it. It's the last thing you would do. So if you're really not a Vaishnava, you enjoy criticism. So to the degree that we enjoy criticizing, that's to the degree that we're not there yet. We're not really becoming devotees. Now, the natural question that comes up, comes up any time we have these kinds of discussions is, but what if something's wrong? I mean, we have to point it out. And that's true. But Unless we're humble, when we point it out, we, become, we can become contaminated and we can disturb others by pointing it out. 
But if we're actually humble, if we think we're, the, we're lower than everyone and we have to point out a fault, it's much different than thinking, hey, you're wrong, because that's coming from some form of pride or ego. Or it's not coming from a, a pure, purely motivated response to what you're doing. So if you enjoy criticizing, then it, it's not going to help the situation very much. So I think it's true we sometimes need to point out mistakes, call a thief a thief, but we really need to work on ourselves to be in a humble position. The humble p person is the best person to criticize, right? So that no one who is not advanced should become a spiritual master. If you enjoy criticizing, don't become a spiritual master because you'll indulge in your own anarthas. It's when you don't that you're qualified to do it. It's when you no longer want to control people, you're qualified to have disciples. It's when you no longer want wealth, you're qualified to receive it. It's when you no longer want to criticize, you're qualified to do it. So we, we want to come to this point where we, we don't feel the need to criticize, but then we're in a position that we can do it. Yes? How would that look? It, it will depend on the... He's asking how would you express that. It would depend on the situation. The people involved, what was done. In some cases, uh, the, first thing, the first thing is to analyze, is there any, is there any result, positive result that's going to come from this? In other words, am I in a position that anyone will listen? Is the person in a position that they would listen? If they would listen, are they in a position that they would do anything? Are they in a position that they could do anything? Would this criticism agitate people? Would it cause a disturbance? Because sometimes the criticism causes more of a disturbance than the misbehavior of the person. Because it creates conflict, it may create conflict amongst people or agitation. So sometimes there's the concept of, okay, just tolerate what this person's doing because they can't do any better, and we work around it. So you have to evaluate every situation. Then if you feel that there would be a positive outcome, then you come in a humble mood. Kind of the mood is, who am I to criticize, but I see... And I, I'm not any better, but I see the behavior of this person is problematic. It's not that I don't like him. I'm not envious. I'm not trying to put him down. I don't, I'm not trying to tell the world how bad he is. I just see that in this situation, the programs that he's managing or the people he's managing are suffering to one degree or another because his behavior is not proper, either his character is not proper or his management is not proper, whatever. And like that, that's, that's the proper mood to the proper person, proper time. And if there is no proper person time or you don't have the proper mood, it's better you don't say anything because you can create a problem. We don't, we don't want to We don't want to hang dirty laundry also, so we have to be careful. Nowadays, when there's a problem, some people go on the internet, and that's not what Prabhupada wanted. He didn't, you know, you have a problem. I sit in front of my phone and do a video about your problem. You know, that's what's going on now. And often, the problem is real. And often the problem is imaginary. But Prabhupada didn't want us to voice problems to the world. Now I understand that sometimes the reason people are voicing problems to the world is because they voiced them locally and nobody listened. Um, that's unfortunate. So um, in answer to your question, let's turn it around the other way. And let's say, what if someone's complaining about me or complaining about someone that I'm working with? How would I deal with it? So that's equally valid question. If someone's complaining to me about someone else, 
or complaining to me about myself, there's a natural reaction of if you have affection for that person or you have an ego that really thinks you're something special and what the person's saying could not possibly be true, that you're going to resist, you're not going to listen. So we have to learn to listen and I, I think this is one of the big challenges of every devotee and especially of every leader to be able to listen to input which doesn't agree with the way they think. Now, your perception of the world is true for you, but it's not true for everybody. And your perception may not be true for you 10 years from now because you realize you're a different person or you know more. And then you'll see that some of the things that you thought to be true were not true. So we were having a, this interesting conversation today. Ormala came to our house for lunch and she was saying, she had done a course in which they taught that what you perceive and what's real is usually not the same thing. Like, I think it's like this, you think it's like that, she thinks it's like that, he thinks it's like this, and we're all convinced what we're seeing is true. But she said through a series of exercises, they were able to understand that often what you say is only what's true for you, and it's not actually absolutely true. It's not exactly the way you saw it. So she said it was funny because they did exercises that made you keenly aware of how you misperceive, how you think it's one way but it's not that way or not everybody sees it that way. And she said, you know, for years we always said we make mistakes, we're subject to be illusion and so forth. And she said that she never realized what that meant until she had personal experience of how illusioned we really are and we don't even know it. So it's nice to keep that in mind when people give you feedback that, you know, it may not be your perception, but it doesn't mean your perception is the only perception and it doesn't mean your perception is even right. So I think that's, that's extremely important, perhaps equally or more important than the way we give feedback is the way we take it. <coughs> yes? <laughs> I'm right, it is a six, and the other person is saying, I'm right, so nine. They're both right, but yeah. just from their perspective. Yeah, yeah, that's true also. It's a six to one person, it's a nine to another person. Yeah. Is it a man and a woman? Because <laughs> that usually, you know, men and women see things differently. Like, I like to ask my wife's opinion because I know she'll often give a different opinion than a man will give. So therefore, I can get a different perspective on it. I say, what do you think about this? What's your intuition on this? Does it mean that I necessarily will agree with it or accept it? But I take it seriously because it's a different, as I won't, a lot of the things that she sees, I don't see. So I consider that. Maybe she's right. Maybe this is. A lot of times, she is, she's right on, and I didn't, she could just feel, this is not going to work. So, it's good to be able to at least hear and consider. I, I have an exercise that I do, it's a very interesting exercise. And I recommend you do this. I purpose, purposefully listen to things I don't agree with. Like... Like if a certain devotee is giving a class that's representing a certain perspective on something, I may know right off the hand that his perspective is much different than mine. Maybe he has a perspective on, on the female issue, women gurus. Maybe he has a perspective on Varnashram versus preaching. Maybe he has a perspective on what Mayapur should be, what, how preaching should be. And I, I've heard him speak, and I know his perspectives are different. I listen to them, and I completely try to understand his perspective, even if I don't agree with him. Of course, if I try to understand, at least what happens is I come to the point of understanding why he thinks that way, even if I disagree. And that's very, very important if we want to get along with others, to be able to 
listen and understand, even if I don't agree, at least now I understand. So you think that if we want to establish Varnashram, then part of establishing Varnashram means that the role of women has to be reestablished. And it's very rare in Varnashram culture that anyone other than a liberated woman would take the position of guru. So you feel that if we allow women to become gurus, then we're going against Varnashram, and this was the other 50% and Prabhupada wants it. So that's, that's their argument, right? So I listen to their argument, I understand their argument, I go, oh, that's an interesting idea. Do I agree? Maybe, maybe not, but I understand it. And I can at least agree that it's a valid perception to some, to, you know, it, within its, within relative considerations of Varnashram, it makes perfect sense. Now we have another side, what about the preaching mission? What about the Prabhupada saying, all oh, boys and girls? So then I listen to the other side, and they're saying, no, we're not, these were never considerations that Prabhupada made, etc., etc. So I listen to that, I understand. And sometimes I'll listen to one lecture that's out in left field, and I'll listen to another one out in right field, completely opposed. And I find that it actually helps me become balanced. Now, what they found psychologically is that if you're very conservative or you're very liberal, you will only listen to conservative or liberal arguments, conservative or liberal speakers, conservative or liberal websites, conservative or liberal Facebook pages, conservative or liberal books. That's just what you'll do. And so you'll, you'll ingrain yourself more and more with that side of the issue. And it'll make complete sense to you. And you become imbalanced. You can't only see one point of view. Now, I don't argue with you because you have this point of view, but I would say as long as you understand and empathize with the other point of view, it's going to be better for our movement to push things forward because ultimately we're not a homogeneous movement. Everybody's not the same. It's just, and it's never going to be that way. And if you're speaking very left or very right, you have to understand it's impossible that everybody's going to think like you. People are more, tend to be more in the center. Now, I read some research which said that in terms of relationships and team, the people who are most sensitive to how other people feel are the most, are, are considered people who will most likely be the best team members. Or not most likely, they will be. If you're sensitive to how I feel, if she's sensitive to how she feels, if I'm sensitive to how you feel, we're all, we all feel one another. Even when you don't tell me how you feel, I can feel you. That's the sign of a good team member, that we'll really be able to work together, we'll know one another. You know, we've given you something, I could see it's really hard for you, and I go, is this hard for you? And you go, yeah, can I help you? And immediately I'll just feel I should help you. We make good team members. But if you're trying to, no, I'm right, you're wrong, but I don't feel like this. Who cares how you feel? It doesn't work. So that's just a recommendation that sometimes you can, it can be philosophy, it can be politics, it can be anything, just as an exercise in balance and to try to understand what the other person is saying and you don't have to agree. And a lot of times if you'll understand, you might start agreeing. Now they did another, another survey which is um, very interesting and this just shows psychology, how we think, that I could present to you statistics and research to disprove what you believe and it won't convince you. You believe this. No. Here, here are the shlokas. Here's the leelas of Prabhupada. Here are the letters. Here are the, you know, the opinions of the most senior Vaishnavas in our movement. Here's the words of the Acharyas. No. I don't, I don't accept it because you have your reason. right? So what the research found is that if somebody you respect gives you the evidence, then you'll accept it. But evidence alone, if your opinion is this way, evidence alone isn't enough unless the evidence comes from someone you respect. And then when they say it, 
You say, okay, that makes sense. I can follow that. Isn't that interesting? So I'm telling you all these things just to show how we're made up. This is our psychology. And so we can be very, very one-sided and narrow-minded. Um, we've talked about these things before. There's, there's, another, there's another thing. It's called something bias. We had talked about this. I forget. It's a, it's a, it's a knowledge bias where you become biased to something you've learned. And even if it's not true, because you've learned it, you know it, you've read about it, you become biased to that, and, and, and therefore nobody can convince you otherwise that it's not true. I know what Pryag's like. He's like this. I have him, I have him analyzed. I've analyzed him, because I've known him for 20 years. I've got him fully analyzed. Even if he acts differently, I will see him acting the way he used to act. Because this is how I see him. And if he acts differently, I'll say, he's putting on a show. He's trying to impress others that he's a nice guy. He's not. He's just going to want to cheat you. So you had a question? Well, there's a, there's a few comments here. Let me go back. Um, give them all. I don't want them to feel neglected. Don't feel neglected, everyone. I plan to get to you. Hello to all of you. So, um, Eddie was saying, can we use pride to serve Krishna? Every, everything can be used. Everything has its spiritual counterpart. But transcendental pride has no contamination. Transcendental pride is full of humility. I'm proud to be part of such a great movement. I'm proud to have such a great spiritual master. I'm proud to have this wonderful service Krishna has given me. But that's not personal pride born of false ego. That's different. So yes. Sarva Shakti, can we post questions here? You can. So now she has. How does this apply in sharing Krishna with others? Meaning that if I am aware that I am not pure at heart and that I am still attached to pride and false ego and envy, how can one share Krishna consciousness with others? Okay, it's a good question because the first thing I did when I joined the movement was go out and thank your time. Like, well, the first thing I did was shave my, have my head shaved. And then the second thing I did the next day was go out and say kirtan. And that meant I was going to share Krishna consciousness with people. And there I was at the Sunday feast, and I was also going to share. And actually, I was sharing Krishna consciousness even before I joined. So this was in the mood. This was in Prabhupada's mood. This is what he wanted us to do. So the answer to your question, the first part is yes, you should share Krishna consciousness. At any stage of your Krishna conscious career, you should share it. The second part of the answer is that you should know that unless you're following what you're teaching, you're going to have a difficult time getting other people to follow it. Because if you're not following it and you're telling them to follow it, they're going to wonder why you're not following it. Which means they're going to think, if you're not following it, it means nobody can follow it. Or nobody, until they're very elevated, can follow it. So why should I try to follow it, since you've been a devotee for 30 years or 20 years, and you can't follow it, right? Now, the other thing to understand is that sometimes you don't have to say anything, but just by who you are, will teach people everything they need to know. Your association will affect their heart. So you understand the power of association, right? So instruction must go along with behavior, ideally. And so you're going to lack potency and you're going to lack success to the degree that you don't exemplify what you teach. Now, the value of teaching what you're not living is that if you're in the right consciousness, it forces you to live it. Because if you're in the right consciousness, you're thinking, I'm teaching this, I'll be a hypocrite if I don't follow it. 
so I should force myself to follow it. Right? I did a facilitation workshop by a big, big professional company, and they said something very interesting. We did, we did the first part of the workshop, we spent maybe half day on trying to discover what we wanted to teach. Like, what do you want to teach? We were being trained to do seminars. So seminar means 20 hours, 30 hours, 40 hours, 50 hours. So what is it that you want to spend the next six months or a year preparing for, and then for maybe who knows how long, the rest of your life teaching? What is it that you want to teach? What's, what would inspire you? And so we did various exercises, but one of the things they said, in order to discover what you want to teach, think about what you want to become. Because you will, you will become what you teach. So, do you want to become a great salesman? Do you want to become a humble devotee? Do you want to become a CEO of a company? Do you want to become a great book distributor? Whatever it is you want to become, you will become more of that by teaching it. And that's natural. So, part of the answer to your question is yes, you have to live it if it's really going to be potent, but think about what you need, where you're lacking in your life, and decide to teach that because it'll help you if you follow this principle. Now, personally, in my old age in Krishna consciousness, not that old, I can still manage. Govardhan Prakrama twice, so I'm still alive here. Barefoot, so we're good, you know, we're still moving. But my mature wiser years then um, I forgot what I was saying so I'm so mature I forgot what I was saying what was I just talking about Seen, I was talking about how I'm not old and now I'm showing you how old I am what was I saying just before that In, uh, we were talking about oh yeah talking about teaching you know, what you teach you'll become so in my mature years, I adopted a policy personally that I won't teach it if I don't live it. Which can mean that if I'm going to teach it, like, like they say, Prabhu, can you give Bhagavatam class? So I look at the verse in the Bhagavatam class says, a devotee doesn't eat or sleep more than is required. And it's like, oh my God, I've been eating and sleeping too much the last week. So, this week, I'm going to cut my sleeping and eating because I want to get the potency to be able to teach the course. And I want the realization because the real power in teaching comes from realization. And if I don't follow it, I'm going to bore everybody. Or even if I give a good class, people aren't going to feel really motivated. They're not going to get much realization because it wasn't coming from my realization. So I adopted the philosophy, if I'm going to teach it, I'm going to practice it. Which was a little easier when I was developing a workshop because I had months and months of time to develop it, and I wanted to understand it deeply, and I felt that the best way to understand it is just live it. So that was one of the reasons I wanted to teach a course on humility. I developed a, this very, it's a very long course. I never taught the whole thing. It could go for like 40 hours on humility, because I really wanted to understand it myself and, and go more deeply into the practice of it. So I thought, let me teach a course on it. So the answer is, ultimately, yes, you should live what you teach, even if it's just in preparation for a class, and maybe you've been sleeping and eating too much, and now the class is about simplifying your life. Okay, so for the next week, simplify your life. You'll have more power. You'll have realization. Say, this week, I tried to simplify my life. This week, I only ate two meals instead of three. I got up at three instead of four, I got up at four instead of five, I got up at five instead of six, whatever it was, these are my realizations. That will have tremendous power. More than, you know, just studying information, right? You agree? Yeah. If you don't agree, get out of here. I'm so humble. I'm so humble, I just can't get over myself. I don't know if there are many people as humble as I am in the world. If God has created people as humble as I am. You know, I read an, an interesting thing, something to contemplate. It said the people who have the hardest time being humble are the best people. People who are moral, people who are upright, 
people who are intelligent and talented, they have the hardest time being humble because they have all the good qualities. So it's a paradox. And, and it's talked about, we'll talk about it tomorrow, it's talked about in this book. Because Narada Muni in his thinking process was, if I make them poor, they'll become trees, they'll become humble. Poor people listen to sadhus, rich people, they don't like to listen. Poor people are empathize, they feel for the sufferings of others. Rich people don't care. One of the, one of the extreme, extreme paradoxes exists in India. It doesn't exist in America. Well, it might exist in Indian neighborhoods in America, but before Indians came to America, it didn't exist. And I don't know if this is hard for you as a Westerner, but it's, it just, when I see this, it kind of drives me crazy. In America, if you go to a shop which is selling expensive gold jewelry or diamonds, that shop is in an expensive neighborhood. And you walk through the neighborhood and the average car will be a BMW, Mercedes, Lexus. The average home will be two to five million dollars. That's where expensive jewelry shops usually are or they're in malls in those neighborhoods. The wealth that you don't generally open a jewelry store in a neighborhood that's not wealthy. In India, you have people walking out of, of gold stores, walking over bums lying on the street. And the bums are, have their hands out, and, they, and the people won't even give them the time of day. That's an American expression. You have that in England? Won't give you the time, they won't, won't even acknowledge that you exist. And every time I see that, it drives me crazy. You know, because the jewelry in India, it's gold. It's, it's priced the same way it is around the world. So this is, you know, this is not like I'm buying something Indian standard pricing. These people are filthy rich if they're buying solid gold in India. You know, a bracelet is what? $500,000, right? So you have to be rich. Even in the West, you have to be fairly well off to spend a few thousand dollars on some jewelry. Most people spend 50 or 100. So a lot of times when you're on that level of wealth, you don't feel for people. We used to do Sankirtan in America on the border between Mexico and America because all the Mexicans would take books and give donations. And they had no money, they were poor. The poorest people were the ones who would always give donations. Not the biggest donations, but they'd always give. And the people who had the money often would just ignore us. So that was part of Narada Muni's mood. We'll make you humble. And your pride will... When you lose your poverty, then you have no position. So what are you going to be proud of? Right? Okay. The Sarva Shakti is saying, I have many problems with my own, so how can I share this pure philosophy with others? The best way to share it is to work on yourself. And so that becomes your impetus. So I should speak to her, Sarva Shakti. That becomes your impetus to share with others. Your impetus to work on yourself comes from your desire. I want to help you, I have to exemplify it. So that's my impetus. Like one of them, personally, giving Bhagavatam class can be challenging because the verse is given to you. If you decide, I want to teach a class, you can pick a topic. What are you going to, can you come to our house and speak? Okay, what would you like me to speak on? They'll give me a few topics. And I'll say, okay, let's speak on this because I can choose something that I'm practicing, or I can choose to practice it. But sometimes they ask you, can you give Bhagavatam class? And sometimes I don't prepare for a class. I don't have time. Sometimes when I travel, I give class every day, and then we're doing programs at night, busy, people seeing me, and sometimes I don't... Sometimes I purposely don't look at the verse, and sometimes I give better classes when I don't look at the verse. But one of the most difficult experiences one of the most um, experiences which I'm looking for the word the word's not disgusting but maybe miserable is to have to speak on a verse which 
is describing exactly the opposite of who you are and what you do and how you think. A pure devotee never thinks like this. A pure devotee always does this, and you're just the opposite, and now you have to give a lecture on it. It's a very miserable experience, or it can be. Now, you could look at it and say, Krishna gave me this verse because he knows I need to develop these qualities, and he knows if I talk about it, it'll help me. So that's there also. I can't guarantee that will always happen. Sometimes it happens, and sometimes it doesn't happen. But it can be a very challenging situation to have to talk about something which you're not following. Often there's questions in classes or counseling, and people will come to me with challenges. And if they come to me with the very challenge I have, it's the same thing. I'm supposed to give you advice about how to be a good husband. I'm the worst husband in the world. I'm supposed to give you advice on how to be a good father. I'm the worst father in the world. How can I do it? Unless I'm a good husband, a good father, how can I really speak from any experience? So it's, it's okay. Now, I give you the advice. As a good father, you should do A, B, C, and D. As a good husband, you should do A, B, C, and D. Maybe I will go home and do that because I told this other person to do it. I should do it myself. Sometimes it happens that way. But, but the answer to your question is ultimately, however it happens, you should follow it. You should follow what you teach. That's where the greatest potency comes. Sarva Shakti, I was at your Guru Maharaj's Vyas Puja whenever the last one was. That was the last year. No, it was this year in April, right? I was at his Vyas Puja. And I'd never been to his Vyas Puja before, and his Vyas Puja was here in Mayapur, Chapitaka Maharaj. There were so many people here, you know, I don't know, the whole the whole temple room, the whole one side, the Panchatattva side was completely full. And I think the Radha side was still, there was, you could sit there, but there's still people there. And I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, how did he create this? That there's so many people that have accepted him as their guru. There's so many people that respect him, that honor him, that get so much from him. And whenever I ask this question, I always think it can't just be what they say because we all have access to the same information. Like I could memorize the lectures that Jai Patakamaraj gives. I could go give the same lectures. I think, okay, that's a strategy. I'm a guru. I want to have 40,000 disciples. I figured out how to do it. I'm going to memorize all the lectures that Maharaj gives, I'm going to memorize all the darshans, I'm just going to say what he says. Do you think it would have the same effect? No, it can't, because it's not what he's saying, it's who he is. So I was sitting there analyzing, because that's what I do. Um, that's the way Krishna created me, I analyze things. So I was thinking, I mean, not to minimize what he's saying, but even, even the lectures that Prabhupada gave, they're not so esoteric that you couldn't give the same lecture. Prabhupada gave very basic lectures. It wouldn't be difficult to give similar lectures. It wouldn't be an impossible task. Study how Prabhupada preached and give similar lectures. But the result would be different. So in my analysis, I thought, well, what is it about him that's creating this phenomenon? And then I realized he just wants to help people and he has no personal desire for himself. He just wants to give himself 100%. And that's why he's so successful. Now you might say, he's a great preacher, he's a great this or he's a great that. That's true. But fundamentally, what's making him successful is that he is just concerned about other people. That's what he thinks about all the time. Isn't it true? So, you know, you can't avoid that if you want to be successful as a preacher, or as a teacher, because that's where your real power comes from, right? Sarva Shakti, we could ask you this question. I'll ask you a question. Could you be a good yoga teacher if you don't know how to practice yoga? Obviously not. 
Could you be a good golf teacher if you don't know how to golf? No. You want to learn golf, best you could learn it from Tiger Woods. That would be good, right? Rather than some anybody, learn from Tiger Woods. You want to learn basketball? Michael Jordan, learn from him. Wouldn't that be better than just some high school coach? Yeah, so you apply the same thing. The more you're Krishna conscious, the more you can give it. So for you, if you want to give Krishna consciousness what you do, you should use that as an impetus to advance. Instead of saying, well, I don't follow a good example, maybe I shouldn't preach. Use it as an impetus, knowing that I need to have a good I need to be a good example, so use it as an impetus. Does that make sense? Uh, okay. Huh. Andrew Kelly, have you seen any good movies? On the airplane, I see all kinds of movies. Um, but I don't know what they're about because they're other people's movies. Um, no, I did see a documentary on the airplane about climbing to the top of the Himalaya and it described that certain people have a DNA that they have to do something basically where they risk their lives. That's normal for them. They have to do it. They have to climb a mountain. They have to fly. They have to parachute. They have to do motorcycles over a mountain. You know, it's part of their DNA. So that was the movie I saw on the airplane, some of my six months traveling. On a long trip, I got bored, and I thought, okay, let's, let's, let's look at what's required to climb to the Himalayas. What kind of determination mentality is required? I thought that was interesting. And they said that for most people, it's a certain kind of DNA. Because like, you would say, why would you want to climb to the Himalayas? Because you could die. So I have, you know, that's just how I am. Why would you risk your life? You could you know, break every bone in your body, climbing a mountain, <clears throat> riding a motorcycle over... Uh, up and down, this and that, but anyway, that was the movie I saw, so I don't know if that helps anybody. So we have another question. How we know that perception of other persons, which is critical towards us, is true, uh, not, their, uh, not just the vision of their own impurities? Just consider it. All you can do is consider it. It may not be true. But at least... <clears throat> My point was at least listen to it. <clears throat> I may not, you're, you're telling me something. I said, I'm going to consider this. I don't really think it's true. It doesn't make sense to me. But at least I want to listen to it and think about it. That I, that's all you can do. And if you're going to be married, you have to do that. Otherwise, you can't be married if you don't listen. You're like this, you're like that. <clears throat> Maybe I am, maybe I'm not, but at least you said it, so let me think about it. See, the problem is we have a conception of what we're like, and if somebody tells us we're not like that, it's hard to hear. Sunil, you think you're an honest person. You think you're a hardworking person. You think you're a straightforward person. You think that you're trying to be sincere. Now, if I come and say, I don't think you're honest, immediately you're going to reject that because it goes against the conception you have of who you are. So that's why it's hard to hear. So if someone says, so, no, you're not honest. You're not really sincere. So, what are you talking about? You know, I've never told a lie. I've been serving for so many years. I never asked for a penny from ISKCON. This, no, you're not honest. You're not sincere. So you know, this, what does he mean? I'll tell you something really, really amazing. There was one of our spiritual masters who left, and I was working very closely with him, and after he left, we had so many troubles, so many devotees left, and it was so hard to maintain the temple, and I had suffered personally in many ways in my service because we lost so many devotees, and and relationships turned sour. People were blaming me. They, Why didn't you tell me my guru was having trouble? Yeah. I couldn't say I would be kicked out of the movement. Or they would have spit in my face if I told them. You're saying my guru has trouble. How dare you? You're offensive. I couldn't. But now I'm getting blamed because I, I didn't tell them in advance. So there were so many troubles. And 
I really, really just turned against him because I felt that uh, he had let us down because he, he just left without telling us. He just like left us, right? How could you just leave us? You just left. You left all your responsibilities. So many, many years later, when I overcame the problem, I had a realization that could have only come from being able to forgive him and getting rid of my anger. That five years before he left the movement, we were working together for many years. I left the zone. I just said, I'm going. I don't want to work with you. I actually left. I actually did the same thing. I didn't fall away from Krishna consciousness, but I left my responsibilities. And I said, I don't want to work with you anymore. I want to get as far away from you as I can. And I went from San Diego, California, to Johannesburg, South Africa. That was pretty far away. I left him. And I took my wife with me, and we were like mainstays of the temple. She was the Sankirtan leader, which is kind of a big thing for the women. And I was college preaching, I was membership, this and that. Most I was preaching practically to all the new people. So, isn't that interesting? That I did that and I didn't realize it? So sometimes we don't realize what we're like. So it's a great art to be able to listen, isn't it? What do you think? Oh, she's saying, well, yeah, maybe it's true, but the person comes with the wrong motive. Okay. But whatever motive they come with, separate that from the truth so you can improve yourself. Okay, they want to expose you to the world, and that's wrong. But the fact is, if you can benefit yourself by what they said, then do it. And don't not listen because of their motives. Sometimes the people who hate you the most are the only ones who are going to tell you what's wrong with you. <laughs> you know? And the higher you go up in ISKCON, generally the less there are people who are going to confront you. I mean, they'll confront you on the internet, but not personally. And most of the people on the internet are imagining what you're like. They've never met you. Most of the people that are criticizing you on the internet have never even met you or talked to you, don't even know you, right? So... Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Sarva Shakti says, I understand it's hard work living it. It's, it is our work. We have to do it if we want to bring people to Krishna. And it's, it's, yeah, I would say it's violence. I bring you to Krishna consciousness. I preach to you. You're convinced. And I can't set a good example. So then how are you going to advance? Because you'll look at my example. <coughs> you know. You get up late, you don't chant your rounds, you're watching movies, you're eating pizza and ice cream at midnight. You know, that's what I see you doing. How is that, how are you going to train me? So it's a, you can think of it kind of as your obligation to people. It's part of the, the full course meal. You brought them in, that's the appetizer, but now you have to give them the meal. That's your example. And Sam Walker, A.K. Sankirtan, Das says, sometimes the best musicians don't know how to teach. If it comes too easily, they don't understand another struggle. Yeah, that's very good. Like they didn't learn, they didn't struggle the hard way. Um, yeah. <laughs> There's a, one, a Sankirtan, one of the acharyas said something interesting. He said that the devotee, he can preach better than Krishna because Krishna, the devotee can come in this world and he knows what suffering is. But Krishna you know, doesn't know what suffering is. He never suffers. So the devotee can empathize with people more than Krishna because of their suffering. So, yes, you struggle to be Krishna conscious. Sarva Shakti, and you teach people through the struggles you've gone through. You can give classes and say, this is how I felt, this is how I thought, these are my anarthas, these are my struggles, and this is how I succeeded. And that's valuable information for people. Isn't it? Yes? Okay, you have any questions, comments? Yes? Krishna, earlier was from 
regarding the exercise that you recommended, which was to hear from people you may not necessarily agree with. Let me repeat. So he's asking a question about the exercise I recommended. Hear from people you don't agree with. So do we have to draw a line somewhere, just like Prabhupada did? Um, for example, listening to Mayavadi. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Back. So he's asking, should we listen to Mayavadi's? Um, no. Although, sometimes we don't have to because Prabhupada explained their philosophy to us. So we, sometimes, you know, you want to know, you want to understand so you can deal with it. Like, okay, I'll listen to an atheist. I'll listen to a scientist. But I was, I was thinking more in terms of things which, are not, which would not be detrimental to our bhakti, which, which would not up, uh, uproot our faith. Just might be this devotee, is, he's really into Varnashram, this devotee is really into a, a more westernized way of meeting the public. You know? Neither one's going to uproot your bhakti. I mean, a very good exercise is to listen to Donald Trump because most people don't like him. And if you can just sit down, okay, well, what is he trying to say? Who, you know, then, uh, then you can listen to the Democrats. So what are they trying to say? You would listen to the devotees said, we should, we should relate to people in this way. Listen to what they're saying. This, no, we should be traditional. This is our culture. This is what we're giving people. Listen to what they say. You know, we, sh we should only read Prabhupada's books. No, when you're ready, you should read all the books of the Acharyas. You know, what? I think it's healthy exercise. But if, if it's something which is contaminating, yeah, of course. Don't listen to it. Yeah, that would be a bad statement. Okay, so we think the movie I saw is called Meru. It's not a movie. It was a documentary. Um, I, I, um, I sometimes get inspired by people who do things which are difficult, because you can learn something. I mean, if you're bored on a 15-hour flight, you know. <laughs> sometimes I read on the whole flight, and when the flight lands, I think, bummer, now I have to get out and meet people. I could keep reading, you know. It was like the first 15 hours I had when I didn't get a phone call in the last six months, you know. So, uh, but sometimes I get bored, you know. That was at a board flight. Um, so Fernanda Diaz says, so can I help people in the marriages if my own marriage has problems? Or should I firstly perfect my marriage before even starting helping anyone? It's better you perfect your marriage. At least what you can do if your marriage has problems, if you understand why it has problems, at least you can teach people what not to do. Say, I know what not to do because I've done the wrong thing. So that's something you can offer because some of the best teachers are the ones who made the biggest mistakes and they can say, don't do this, this is a mistake I made. So you can teach people from your mistakes. Right? Yes? I do that all the time. You don't know that I'm doing it, but a lot of what I understand is because I made the mistake. So I'm saying you should do this. Why do I know you should do this? Because I did that, and it didn't work. And I discovered I should do this instead of that. So I'm telling you I did this. You don't know that I learned how to do this because I did that first. So sometimes, uh, yeah, if you're doing the wrong thing in marriage, but it's helping you learn to do the right thing, then that's great. Uh, and, all right, okay. So that I think we're going to end now. If you want to hear this class again, it will be on my website, SoundCloud, and it will also be posted on Facebook once I hit the finish button, which I'm going to push right now. Three, two, one. Is there, anyone else have any questions? Yes. Okay, I'm not going to push the finish button. Don't go yet. Well, perfect person means one who's heard from the perfect person. So he's asking, if I want to find a perfect person like a spiritual master, and I'm judging, does that mean I'm judging how perfect you are and if you're imperfect and so on? No. I think within ISKCON, the idea is 
that anyone who's a spiritual master, because he's representing Parupad, his knowledge is perfect. But some who are representing it may resonate with you more than others. That, that you, when you hear from them, you feel like serving Krishna a lot more, or you understand Krishna consciousness a lot better, or you feel more comfortable, or you feel like serving this person, you feel indebted in some way that a relationship is developing which is motivating you more. So they're all good. Like, like I say, you know, in ISKCON, all the spiritual masters are good. So you can't make a mistake. Should I choose this one or that one? No, anyone you choose is good, and anyone you choose will allow you to have other six gurus. So even if, even if you thought, actually, I think I cho- chose the wrong one, you know, ten years later, I think I chose the wrong one, it doesn't matter, because they're, the one that you wanted to choose can be your six guru, right? So, um, you know, there may be many reasons for choosing a spiritual master. And um, my personal experience is that for many devotees, I have much more relationship with them than they have with their own spiritual master because their spiritual master has too many disciples to deal with them or he's not, as, he's not in the proximity that I am. Or they don't have the access or there are problems they have that they feel uncomfortable going to their spiritual master with. So it's not maybe as big a decision as we think it is because... We have access to all the devotees, and they're all good. I mean, obviously, you want to accept a spiritual master who you can surrender to, who inspires you. But there's so many devotees that can inspire you. It's a tough decision. So, you know, should I accept this one, that one? And people ask me, I say, no, they're all good. Yeah. What about a Toyota? What about a Nissan? What about a Honda? Yeah, they're all good. What about a Mitsubishi? Yeah, it's also good. Hyundai, it's also good. What about a Chevrolet? Uh, I don't know about Chevrolet, but... Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Anybody else have anything? Um, the, this, this is one of the this is a good I'm glad you asked this question because this is such an interesting question because I didn't have to make a decision on who my guru was when you joined the Hare Krishna movement during Prabhupada's time that was not a decision that anybody made so you know whenever anyone ever said how do you choose a guru my immediate gut response is Ugh. I never did that. So I can't speak from realization. So I kind of have to go into your world and understand it from your perspective, understand it philosophically. But when we joined, it was, it, the, there was only one guru and everybody wanted that guru. And uh, it was such an awkward thing for us when Prabhupada left and then people we're trying to choose a guru and asking us, how do we choose? We had no point of reference. I didn't even ask to be initiated. I was told, you're getting initiated. Here's your guru, you're getting initiated. Now, wouldn't that be weird if you joined the temple and I said, Sunil, next Monday you're getting initiated by this person? (laughs) That'd be weird, right? So, you know, if it was Srila Prabhupada, it wouldn't be weird. And even if you weren't ready, it wouldn't be weird because you could just do it, right? Uh, so, it kind of goes to Sarvashakti's point. I have, I think I can answer this question fairly well, but when I answer it, if you ever look at me, you could see I'm kind of struggling because I can't find a reference point in my life to answer this question. I can only answer it from what I perceive in the lives of other devotees. And even that is a little confusing because everyone's experience is different. You know, some people have gurus they're never going to talk to. And many of us never talked to Prabhupada and it was like, no problem. Some people, 
if they can't talk to their guru, they would think, why would I want a guru if I can't talk to him? It's, you know, everybody's different, right? So it's a, you know, it's a very individual thing. But the ultimate answer is everyone is perfectly, everyone is representing Prabhupada. So everyone is a perfect person in that sense. So they're representing Prabhupada. But you, in listening to different gurus, you, maybe you feel Prabhupada more strongly through one than another. Or maybe you feel one is, he's very broad-minded. He brings in the discussion of philosophy with all the acharyas, and you know, it's, it's like such an amazing understanding. And I feel more comfortable with that, more inspired with that, more open with that. And some devotees, I feel they're too constrained, and how they, you know, so everybody's different. So um, they're not going to let us go because for them, some of them just joined. So. How did you get into Krishna consciousness? Krishna pulled me in. That's how I got in. He just pulled me. I had no choice. Um, could one have personally met Prabhupada and been initiated by a disciple of Prabhupada? Thus feel like both disciple and grand disciple. Yeah, there are devotees like that. That they first initiated by Prabhupada, second initiated by um, Prabhupada's disciple. And they have so much respect often for their god brother, they see him as guru also. Mm. I know you want to go, the questions keep coming. <laughs> Is it important for devotees to address their emotional problems like being over emotional from psychological perspective? Or should we just continue our practice and hope that during the time it can change? Um, it depends on what the problem is and how deeply rooted it is. Um, I heard devotees saying that with the practice of gunas change and then some problems just disappear. Therefore, it's a waste of time to address them. Um, yes and no. I mean, you could say they disappear, but if you've been practicing for so many years and they haven't disappeared, then how can you say they disappeared? You have to deal with them. And if you deal with them, actually, go on my SoundCloud. The best answer to this question is I gave four lectures on how your psychology affects the quality of your japa. And that, was, that would be kind of my answer to this question. That yes, in some cases, it will solve your problem because your problems are not deeply rooted. But in some cases, your psychological nature gets in the way of your ability to execute devotional service. And I gave four, like, I don't know, two, three hour lectures at Kirtan Academy on that very topic. And I think everyone should listen to it because it's so interesting. Because it, it reveals problems that we bring to Krishna consciousness that, that affect our practice of sadhana that we don't even know we have and we wouldn't even believe. It's time to end class, everyone. My daughter is calling, and as a good father, I will answer. Is that okay? So we're going to finish. Hare Krishna. All glories to Prabhupada. Hare Krishna.